Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Dr. Money Matters podcast. My guest today is Ian Ippolito, a serial tech entrepreneur and creator of the realestatecrowdfundingreview.com website. Uh, this is a website which uh, analyzes the different platforms and a lot of uh, uh, listeners to the podcast have asked about um, crowdfunding. And so I thought Ian would be a great guest to get on here and, and discuss this. Uh, Ian, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, we've had some serious tech issues today and I really <laughs> appreciate your patience with me. Uh, this is uh, the first time we're doing a uh, video recording and I thought it would be simple, but um, you know, computers uh, can, can, nev you know, can never be as simple as you'd like, so. No, no. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a former tech entrepreneur, so I understand completely. I, I appreciate it. You've, you've got a lot of patience to do this. So, <laughs> um, so let's just uh, start real quick. Tell me uh, what got you into uh, real estate crowdfunding. Sure. So like I said, I'm a former uh, serial tech entrepreneur. I, I had a really good exit in 2013 and sold my company. So at that point, my job was to start investing. And I got the traditional advice to go into the public markets and split it between bonds and stocks. And I was like, you know what, there has to be more. So at the time, real estate crowdfunding was just starting. And so there were about 25 platforms. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna, there was no information on it. So I said, I'm gonna go figure this out. So I hired somebody and together we got data on every single one of the platforms. And we, I interviewed people who, investors, I interviewed the people, the people running them. I looked into their legal agreements to figure out where I wanted to put my money. And uh, I told a few people about it, and then the word kind of got out, hey, Ian has this list, and I got, uh, so, so I started emailing it to a bunch of people. And then after a while, I got tired of doing that over and over again. I said, look, I'll just put it on this website. Yeah. So, uh, so that's basically how it started. So it started with that real estate crowdfunding Rue website. Now it gets like 12,000 uh, investors coming in every single month. Wow. And then it grew into this private investor club where we like look at the deals. So it's just, uh, it, it, it's been really good. Good, good. Okay. Well, so you mentioned 2013. And uh, when we were uh, previously talking, you had said that even at that point, there were a fair number of platforms out there. Oh, so, yes. Um, you know, I think many of my listeners and myself, I started hearing about crowdfunding in these various uh, uh, platforms, um, probably a similar time, maybe a little bit later. Um, and I know Websites like uh, Prosper and Lending Club were around for a little bit longer, um, but uh, you know it's really the the real estate part of it has seemed to you know catch fire uh, in the last few years, and so yeah. let's let's talk a little bit about it. Um, what uh, can you give me a state of the market now? Uh, just a general overview of of real estate crowdfunding in two thousand nineteen. Sure, sure. Well, it's hard to talk about it without kind of talking about the cycle. Right. So, and you know, we, no one knows exactly where you are in the real estate cycle, but we know that there are cycles just like there are business cycles. Right. Personally, I think we're kind of late in the cycle. Uh, what we're seeing is kind of like typical late cycle stuff. So we've got, so, so back in the day, there were like 25 platforms. It actually grew to probably about 200, I'd say at the top. Yeah. And then there was kind of a shakeout where there was kind of difficulty with some of these platforms getting money. Yeah. And so now, you know, there, there's less than there was. And there's kind of a couple of, I would say like six or seven now that have like kind of like consolidated where they have the most deals. So if you're an investor, you probably want to hit those top six or seven and you're going to see 95% of what's out there. And then the rest, I mean, if you have time, you can look, but you know, for some, it's just not worth you know, trying to weed through the bottom layer. So there's kind of been that kind of like separation right. between the two. Right. Um, so, and, and it's good, I think, for the market. There, there's still no one, one leader and there's kind of different platforms that specialize. So you've got the platforms that specialize in debt. So, you know, this is a, you know, it, to understand the investing, you know, you've got the real estate capital stack. So you can invest in debt, you can invest in equity. And then sometimes it gets more complicated and there's other things you can invest in, but debt, in, in an investment is the safest because it basically has the protection of collateral. Mm -hmm. If the person doesn't pay you, you foreclose, you take over the property, you sell it and you get back, hopefully you get back all your money, maybe even what you expected to get. So there, there's quite a few platforms that specialize just in debt. Then you've got the other ones that are a little higher up in the capital stack. They specialize in equity. So 
So, so the deal with debt is that it's safe, but you are capped on your return. Maybe you're going to make 7%, maybe eight, whatever it is, 8%. It's never going to be more. It's never going to be less. Well, it could be less if you don't get paid, but it's right. never going to be more. Right. <laughs> so, so there's a cap. Equity, you take more risk because the debt is senior to you. You know, if something happens, they get paid first. But generally, there's almost unlimited upside. You know, maybe, maybe you could double or triple your money or whatever in a certain period of time. So there are platforms that specialize in that. And there's a couple that are kind of doing both. So you've got all these different types of platforms out there. Okay. Okay. So just to kind of recap, the debt portion um, is, is almost like uh, holding a mortgage note uh, yep. for, for the investment. And then the equity side is you're actually part of the purchasing group of the physical uh, asset. And then if there's appreciation on top of the actual uh, uh, income, that you're, you're a part of that. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. And then with these platforms, what I found is that there's actually a big difference, even say if you're going just to debt or debt just to equity, between the protections that they offer the investor. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the biggest questions I had back in 2013 and still have today is what happens if they go out of business? Right. You know, um, is my investment going to be tied up in limbo? Well, that has actually happened on a couple of platforms since then. They've gone out of business. And right. so it's important that they, they, the platform have bankruptcy protection. So if they go bankrupt, I want to know that the entity is still going to be there and alive and kicking. And, and hopefully there's some way for someone else to run it because they're not going to be able to do it. So either there's a way for me to vote with the other shareholders and, and take, you know, take it over, or there's a backup administrator. So there's things like that. There's protections on some of them where they'll put their own skin in the game, meaning they'll invest alongside you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I feel a lot more comfortable that they have really done more due diligence if their own money is at risk. Right. Um, and uh, I, I came up with just kind of like nine or 10 different things where I, I wanted to kind of evaluate these platforms and kind of decide which ones I was going to invest in. Okay. Okay. So um, you had mentioned that uh, the, there have been a case of a few that have gone uh, on, on either bankruptcy or gone out of business. Um, what has happened to the investors in those, uh, in those situations or investors or note holders? Yeah. Well, uh, there's been two prominent ones. Mm -hmm. um, one was I funding and the investors were stuck in limbo for a little bit. They didn't know. So the platform declared bankruptcy and there's all these investors in their own little, these are little LLCs that hold their investments. Right. No one's there to run them. So, and then the question is, does this get sucked into the bankruptcy to satisfy the creditors, which would be really bad. Now you could lose all your money. So, um, so there was, a, there was an unknown what was going to happen. What eventually happened is uh, this kind of uh, called a white knight came and it was one of the investors, one of the biggest investors that they had said, look, we will run it. Uh, we will take over from them. And they asked everyone to vote that they could take over. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately it was set up where that was allowed and in advance. And so they did that. So there, after a period of uncertainty, these new people took over. Mm -hmm. um, and there was another platform that uh, also had a similar sort of thing where they, they shut down and they, they basically just sold all their investments to another company. So now that other companies are so invest in, you know, there've been a lot of complaints about that because, you know, okay, there's these sponsors that are, you know, that you're investing in. They understand that there's a lot of turnover here between these two. It's hard to keep track of how they made their payments, you know, and some of the investors are saying that the sponsors are taking advantage. They're not making their payments when they were supposed to. Right. And it's so difficult to track what's going on between these transitions and right. where they're not getting paid, things like that. Okay. So um, these, these platforms, uh, how do they make money? Is it just the, the basically um, a transaction fee where we're putting together the investors and then the people seeking the funds and then just for ongoing, basically, there's a percentage that we, we take for ourselves? There's a couple ways they do it. So some of them are kind of like a Craigslist. Mm -hmm. So they'll just say, you know, you, you post your deals up here. There's a cost to posting your deal, but we're not going to charge you anything else. Like we don't charge you the investor. So, there, so CrowdStreet is a, is a big platform. Uh, they run that way. Then there are other ones. Real Crowd is another one. Uh, then there's a, another kind of model. And actually one of the platforms that went uh, bankrupt, or mm -hmm. let's just say they, they shut down. Right. Um, they were running with that model where they were charging a percentage. Right. And, uh, and the issue there, at least from the point of view of the investors, is that if they charge a percentage, they have to provide more service than you know, going directly to the sponsor, mm -hmm. uh, which is tough because they're in the middle. 
So every time the investor has a question, they have to forward it and get the answer back. There's an opportunity for them to mess up. And apparently they did a lot, according to investors. Uh, they said they wouldn't get timely information. If anything went wrong, it was very difficult to find out what was going wrong. Um, tax information had to be relayed. They said it wasn't reliable or consistent. So um, no one has been able to really perfect that model yet where they are kind of the go-between mm -hmm. because it involves so much. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that are doing better right now are the ones where they just take a fee from the, uh, the sponsor. They don't charge anything to the investor. They don't take a, a fee. Okay, okay. Um, and so how do the overall, well, you just mentioned that the fixed fee is a one-time thing um, and, and that seems to be better. Um, how are the returns now uh, uh, on, on crowdfunding um, uh, versus uh, you know, other uh, asset classes? Not, not just like how they were compared a few years ago, because we, as we all know, pretty much everything's, like you said, late cycles, so returns have, have kind of come down a little bit. But how, yes. how does, uh, uh, I guess a more, uh, I, I guess a, a better question is, how does real estate crowdfunding returns compare to like investing in a REIT or a uh, you know, fund of, uh, uh, of REITs? So still, you're talking about real estate, basically. Yeah, yeah, kind of like, yeah. Okay, okay. So to remove the real estate aspect of it yeah. and just kind of compare the structure. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is in crowdfunding, you can invest in a REIT, actually. There are REITs out there. Now, um, they're private REITs. Right. So when you say REIT, you're talking about- I'm talking about like the Vanguard, uh, you know, REIT fund or, yeah, publicly traded REITs, basically. Yes, yes. Okay, so- Here's the advantage and disadvantage of the crowdfunding over that. So uh, typically the yields on, you know, like a, a publicly traded REIT, which has the advantage of daily liquidity, right. you can just cash it out anytime you want. Right. That, that daily liquidity is really nice, but the, you, you pay for it. You pay a premium for it. Right. By, by locking up your money, typically these will lock your money up. They might be five years, seven years, but it's not liquid. Mm -hmm. So if you have the ability to lock your money up, if you're choosing wisely, you should be able to get a premium for that. So you should be getting more. So if you know Vanguard is doing four, you know an equivalent one should be doing more. I mean, there, there's there's ones that are returning six, seven, eight, nine percent. You know, uh, as far as distributions, and then when they sell at the end, you hope to get price appreciation. Right. That's kind of similar to the Vanguard, where maybe the price of the stock will hopefully go up when you sell it, right. and then you know you sell it that way. Okay. So so that's the main difference. So you 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 lose the daily liquidity. But if you're, if you're choosing well, you should be making more money. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and then you had mentioned, uh, you know, the due diligence. Um, and I think that's one thing that people seem to, you know, if you're investing in a, in a property near you um, or you're buying a big piece of real estate yourself or with a group of people, obviously you're, you're going to do a lot of due diligence on the, the location, the real, you know, the physical structure, things like that. With with crowdfunding real estate, it's it's obviously difficult because you can invest. If I'm in Phoenix, I can invest in Florida where you're at, or I can invest in New York or wherever. So, what what do you suggest uh, investors do in terms of due diligence for those uh, types of deals? Well, that, that's a good question. I mean, that's really what it comes down to because. Um, if a person can't feel comfortable doing due diligence on something remotely, then it's just not the asset class for them. Um, there's kind of like two things, like if it's a, a particular deal, like one property, you're checking out the property itself and you're checking out the sponsor, or it could be a fund. So you may be just, you may not even know what they're gonna invest in in advance. It's called blind pool sometimes. Right. Sometimes you know it's already in the fund, you can look at it because it's already established, but many times you don't. So then it's just looking completely at the sponsor. So um, like I myself, I'll look at, you know, hundreds of deals in a month. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the year, I might invest in only four or five. So I'm going through, I'm churning through like a whole bunch of deals. Right. Um, so to do that, obviously I can't go in depth on every single deal. So I have my own process, which, you know, basically I start with the sponsor first. Okay. And, uh, and everyone has their own methods, you know, sure. some people start with the deal first, but for me, if I go into the weeds on the deal and then the sponsor ends up being no good, it's a waste of time. So I start with the sponsor. I look for certain things. Like since we're late cycle right now, I look for someone, like if it's in a, a mainstream asset class, like let's say the most typical deal, it's an apartment complex. Right. People love apartment complexes. You, have, you live there. Um, anything, the closer you are to shelter, the more of a necessity it is. So, um, you know, 
uh, it's been fairly recession proof in last in previous recessions, not always, but mostly. Um, so it's the most popular. So typical multifamily deal. I'll look for a sponsor that I want to see at least one full real estate cycle experience and with no money loss, preferably. Okay. Um, that weeds out 90% of them right there. <laughs> I feel like that's true because I've said this to a lot of people. I'm like, right now, everyone looks like uh, amazing investors because so many of them have come out since 2011, 2012, you know, and all they've experienced, no matter what they're investing in, stocks or real estate um, is, is appreciation. So I, th I like how you say that because that, that I think it, people need to hear that from more and more people. <laughs> well, experience yeah. matters. Yeah, experience matters. And if we have a bad recession, it will be very apparent, you know, the differences between the two. Right. So yeah, so I have just a checklist of things that I, I, I go through. So how do you do that though? Is that just a, sorry, uh, is that just because they've been uh, investing for, let's say, instead of five, eight years? Because some of these younger people will tell you that, um, well, I just wasn't around back then. I would have made yeah. better deals, but I, I can't be through there. But is that what you're doing? You're just saying, okay, these are people, you know, who have been investing for 15, 20 years, maybe. Yeah. I mean, maybe some of those younger guys and, or people are going to be great, you know, but I'm kind of like, why should I risk my money on someone like that when I have the alternative of someone who has been through one or more real estate cycles? And, and what happens is when they go through those downturns, mm -hmm. they become more conservative. Right. And, um, and I'm a conservative investor. You know, if someone is very aggressive, you know, they might be fine with just, you know, taking, taking a shot on it. But right. I, I want to see them seasoned by hard times to what I find is usually then they lower their leverage. Right. They're going to put more skin in the game. They do all these different things, things that are very different than the people who are used to only running in a, in a good economy. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So you look at the sponsor. If you like the sponsor, then you start looking at the deal. Yes. Yes. So I have a number of things I, I look at in the sponsor and then I look at the deal too. Like I, and I kind of have a, a, a quick version of what I look at first, which also out of what's left will eliminate like 90% where okay. I'll just look. And again, I'm conservative. So if someone is more aggressive, this might be too conservative for them. But for me, I'll look and I'll say, okay, let's look at the leverage. So uh, I want to see it conservatively leveraged. If it's a multifamily deal, 65% leverage or less. That weeds out a whole bunch. They're just too aggressively leveraged. Um, I want to see that the, that the sponsor has considerable skin in the game. So meaning that they invested alongside me in cash and on the same terms. And if the deal goes bad, they're going to feel the pain. That's really what I want to see. Uh, that kind of mitigates some of the compensation structures that you see in this asset class. Mm -hmm. um, people who may or may not be familiar with it, if you're more familiar with like stocks and things like that. So it's more like private equity where they're, they're going to charge management fees, mm -hmm. but then there's also going to, they're going to take a percentage of the profits. So there's going to be a waterfall and there's going to be a preferred return and a split, which is all great. You know, they, they don't get paid unless, you know, they, unless they make a profit. But right. the perverse side of that is if you look at the structures, the more they return, the more they take. Right. So these really incentivize them to push the risk envelope. And that's not what I want right. So as a conservative investor. So to offset that, I want high skin in the game and some of these other things. So I look at that. I look at the debt. I want to see like how our interest rates going to affect this. Interest rates are going crazy right now. Right. So, you know, if it goes down, what's going to happen? If it's going to go up, what happens? I like to see them. Lock. Personally, I like to see them lock in long-term debt. Mm -hmm. so then that way I know what it is. You know, may, maybe 10 years from now, interest rates will be lower than now. And that's not a good idea, but I would rather, since I'm conservative, I'll take right. that risk. I just want the certainty of knowing that it's going to be okay right. versus in the great recession, you know, where, a bunch of people weren't able to refinance their loans. They lost everything, you know, rising or falling interest rates messed them up. So, um, you know, I'm looking for that certainty. Okay. So, so I like, I like the process that you're describing. You said um, that you filter out uh, 90 plus percent of those deals based on your criteria. Um, to me, it would seem like the people, most of the people that would fit your criteria wouldn't go to crowdfunding to raise funds. Is that, is that true? <laughs> well, you know, th th there is definitely a, a big element of truth to that. Um, the majority, when, so earlier in the cycle, I was investing more in the crowdfunding public platforms, mm -hmm. but you're right. These, these experienced seasoned sponsors, they don't need crowdfunding because they, they have so many investors. There, there's one that I, I one of them that I love, uh, invest in every single one of their deals when I can, their deal will fill up in about 24 hours, you know, they'll, they'll be filling like 30 or 40 million in 24 hours. 
wow. versus like a crowdfunding platform, you know, they might, uh, they might fill a million dollars in a couple of weeks, you know? Right. So um, there's no reason for them to go. So right. to source those kind of deals, it's important to have a network. So it, I think it's important to belong to an investment club. Mm -hmm. And actually I think I mentioned that was, that's part of the reason why I created an investment club right. behind the real estate crowdfunding review to be able to source these off market deals that are just not available otherwise. Okay. Okay. And so generally these clubs uh, uh, networks that you describe um, require higher levels of uh, um, net worth accreditation uh, as opposed to crowdfunding. But um, I, th I think most of my listeners are, you know, usually qualify for that status, but can you give me a difference in what the minimums might be for investing in one of the deals that you describe in, in your network versus in your, uh, just in the public crowdfunding ones? Okay. So public crowdfunding, it's typically around 25 K, but can be as low as 10 K occasionally on some of these non-accredited offerings. Mm -hmm. They might be as low as 500, but the quality of these are not very high. Uh, not a lot of skin in the game, not a lot of experience, et cetera. Um, so, so you got that on the crowdfunding side. So then now here, on these deals that we're able to find and we just network with each other and like, Hey, I found this deal, you know, um, they range, but yes, they are higher. They tend to be higher. Um, they might be anywhere from a hundred K to $5 million of a minimum. So oh, wow. some of them are very high. Right. So that's the other thing in the club that we do. So if it's a, it's a $5 million minimum, there's not a lot of people that are going to write a $5 million check. Right. So what we do is we'll aggregate our money together okay. and we'll say, Hey, well, you know, $5 million for one is, is a lot, but, Together, you know, we might put a hundred people together and give them a check. So that's the other thing that we do too. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. And so uh, you had talked uh, a little bit about the the cycles uh, before, and you mentioned you know we're kind of late cycle. On your website, I, I like how you break it down. You talk about the uh, physical cycle and then the financing cycle, and you you're saying you know we're late in the physical, but midway through the financial. Can you explain the what, what you mean by the difference of those two? Sure, sure. And, and that is just my personal opinion, you know, sure. it's like no yeah. one knows for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so you've got two different types of cycles. So you've got the physical cycle, which is, is very closely connected to the business cycle and connected to the stock market and things like that. When the economy has a recession, what happens to real estate is that the rents go down mm -hmm. and occupancy goes down. So as a result, the money that you make off of a property, you know, goes down. So the income goes down. Right. But but real estate is just like a stock. It's got two components to the return. You've got the income and you've got hopefully price appreciation. So what's interesting about real estate, unlike the stock market, for example, stock market, if there's a recession, your stocks are gonna go down, your prices are gonna go down. Right. With real estate, that doesn't always happen. And that's the financial cycle. The financial cycle, so you've got the physical cycle, which is pretty quick, mm -hmm. and you've got the financial cycle, which is much longer. The financial cycle dictates when prices go up and down in real estate. and so. So for example, like in the 2001.com crash, you know, stock market went down, right. but real estate prices really didn't. And they actually rose a little bit. So, uh, so that's a completely different cycle. The, the pricing is based really on global money flows. It's like, you know, money coming in from different countries into the U S and buying real estate. It has to do with how people think of real estate in comparison to other asset classes. You know, it's like, Right now, people have been kind of fleeing to real estate from, from like the stock market and stuff like that because it's a lot less volatile. So these support, so this makes it not quite dependent on the economy like almost everything else is. Yeah. So that's the financial cycle. Okay. That's a much longer thing. I, I hope we are not near the end of the financial cycle. Right, right, okay, all right, good. Those, that's a good explanation. Um, and so let me see if there's, uh, those are good, uh, you know, good tidbits and knowledge that you're providing. Let me just ask you one other question. Um, uh, and now, you know, in real estate crowdfunding, there's more niche uh, operators. In fact, uh, uh, there's stuff that does in, you know, land only or farms or you name a niche, I'm sure there's one out there. Any ideas on how those are performing versus the, the bigger, broader um, uh, you know, crowdfunding plays? Sure, sure. So you've kind of got a spectrum of strategies, kind of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You've got the very conservative core and core plus strategies where it's like, let's buy an existing building. I probably don't even need to fix it up very much. Right. Uh, you know, that's going to be yielding the lowest versus the more risk you take, the more, the higher the projected return. So what you're talking about, like raw land. So you can take land and you can do what they call entitle it. So basically you basically get all the permissions from the local government 
to maybe build houses on there or whatever is going to happen. Right. So the law, the raw land is not worth very much. So you can get it up for a cheap price, but you add all this stuff on top of it and you make it ready to develop. It's worth a lot. So you can flip it. Um, it is a, a very profitable, much more profitable than the other uh, strategies, but there's more risk. If we have a downturn or a recession, the person could be stuck with that. And now they're paying the taxes every year on something that's producing no income. Right. So, um, so, you know, it just depends on the type of risk that someone is willing to take. It's the same thing with those asset classes you're talking about. So you've got, you've got kind of like your four main asset classes, which is like, you know, office, hotels, maybe. Um, you've got multifamily. Um, you know, there's a couple other ones too, depending on how you look at it. Right. Um, then you've got the ones that are kind of like a little less mainstream, might be mobile home parks. Some people are really interested in those. Right. Self-storage, um, you know, different, different types of things. Each one has its own characteristics, risk reward profile. Like for example, like I'll, I'll say hotels. Mm -hmm. Hotels are yielding very high right now, but on the downside, every single other past recession, they've been very fragile. They're the first to go down mm -hmm. and they take the longest to come up and they go down the hardest. So, you know, maybe that's not the, for an aggressive investor, it's good probably. For a conservative investor, I, I mean, I'm staying clear of those. Uh, but then you've got like self-storage. So in the last recession, self-storage did very well, held up you know, right. pretty well. Um, but I'll add to that, what's <laughs> happened in, in this cycle is that everyone knows that now. Right. So right. everyone's building all these self-storage units and now you have to worry about oversupply. So the next recession may not be the same. Okay. So there's a lot to understand with each of these asset classes. Each one is, uh, you know, a person really has to understand the details before pulling the trigger if, if they want to make a, an informed decision. Right, right. Okay, good. Well, thank you. I mean, this has been uh, really a good education and an overview about, uh, about this class. I know a lot of people are, like you say, you know, a lot of people are, are looking to diversify away from just traditional stock market investments. Most of my audience uh, are working physicians, and so they don't they don't have the time to go into buying a, a property themselves, uh, or, or at least yes. they feel like they don't uh, have the time to do it. And so they look at crowdfunding as a way of kind of you know getting into the space without maybe doing all the work. Uh, but I think you've described quite well that <laughs> it's still a lot of work. It may be a little bit different on the uh, due diligence but you still have to do due diligence. And again, yes. that doesn't change uh, no matter what investment you do. And I think people would be, uh, um, you know, would do well just to remember that part of it. Yes, yes, I, I think that, that is a fantastic thing. And, and I will say some of the sites do market themselves as if yes. you can just throw the money in, don't really worry about it. And so I think following your advice is a much better idea for, right. for preserving your money. Right. Right. Well, Ian, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really uh, appreciate uh, you, your patience with all my technical issues earlier today. And uh, I really uh, I'm glad that you're able to share your knowledge with my listeners. Tell, tell my, realist, uh, my listeners uh, where they can find you. Again, I, I'll put a link on the show notes, but uh, uh, tell them uh, where they can find you and your, and your blog. Sure. So uh, visit the real estate crowdfunding review.com. It's all spelled out. Mm -hmm. um, you can see all the reviews. You can see, actually, I even go into some of the investments on the platform and say, here's what I like about it. Here's what I don't like about it. So someone can kind of see that. I have my own guide to due diligence that I have out there. I actually have my portfolio. I put it out there too. So people can see the different things that I invest in and how they're doing. And for those that are interested, they can also sign up for the investor club too. And that's where we share the due diligence, we source the new deals, we negotiate discounts and aggregate our funds together to, to hit those really high minimums on some of these uh, sponsors. Perfect. Now, is there any fees to, uh, to join your club? No, nope, no. Nope. Membership is free. We just have to, everyone does have to be vetted because it's really important that people can trust the information that's in there. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want people who are, have associations with sponsors, you know, putting out false information. Right. So there is a, there is a vetting process but uh, membership is completely free.